Good evening, everyone, and welcome to BT's Fly Tying Friday. Tonight, the 24th of March, 2023, we're just going to be tying some fish and flies. And the weekly tip, we're going to talk about no weight options to weight your flies. I know that sounds like probably misleading, but we'll, we'll show you a little trick, and maybe everybody already knows it, but Gretchen will be sharing that with you. But today, we're going to just tie some flies and chat. Feel free to chime in wherever. We'll uh, be kind of explaining what we're doing. We'll be tying tonight two of our uh, favorite patterns. Grab your cell phones. I'm going to pop the uh, recipes up. First, Gretchen will be tying the easy crayfish. And we've done this before. You've never seen it, though, with the kind of weight that we're going to put in the body. And uh, you can see there, take a picture. For the easy crayfish, you'll have the recipe for later, or you can just go back and check the recording on Facebook or YouTube. And the other fly that we're going to be tying, you've seen this one before too, but it's such a darn good fly. It's taking number one spot in my personal fly box. Mm -hmm. It's a fly we call the double E. <laughs> we'll explain a little bit about it, but it's a fly that you tie with a hook, thread, and one feather. And weight is optional. I'm going to be putting weight with this particular one. Anyway, what we're going to do is go to our side-by-side -side type presentations. Yeah, so you're going to be seeing Gretchen in the upper right corner, and uh, my fly is in the lower lower left corner. In fact, that's the uh, the double E, and um, pretty easy fly. All of that is on the lower one is done uh, with one feather, and of course some other materials, thread, and so forth. And there's Gretchen's crayfish. And I'm going to let her start out because the weighting that she uses in that is very unique. And if you happen to live in an area or have a stream in your area or body of water that does not allow lead in the body for weighting, this is a way to weight the fly, get it down fast, and not use lead to get the job done. So Gretchen, I'll let you take off. And so I'm going to start, start off with a tip, am I? Oh, the tip is kind of. Right. I got to do it. So yep. let's let's take a look at this first. Go right back here. Yeah. So what I do first is I take a chamois and my rolling cutter that I use for uh, quilting and cut these little strips of chamois. And so I have several noodles of chamois ready to go. Okay. For, That's those, the tip. for those of you that don't know what chamois is, you get it at the auto supply store. It's the skin of an animal for washing your car. It, it, used, it is real leather. Yeah, it's real leather. It used to be the chamois was uh, out of a particular kind of goat. I don't think it's from this part of the of the of the world. I think it's another country. But anyway, the stuff we're getting in the United States now is mostly sheepskins that have been split. Uh, with the hide side going to some kind of a leather product and the flesh side, what we have for chamois. Anyway, for that, we'll get now so that Gretchen can take off. And there you go, dear. No, oh, thank you. I'm going to start. I'm going to tie a size four. And the reason I'm tying a size four is I had some packets already made up that I was giving away at a show. So I just am using one of those. So first thing I'm going to do is just uh, pinch the barb. And I find Sometimes I pinch on the really small flies. I pinch the barb right in my vice. But I find on this bigger <coughs> hook, it just doesn't work. So the barb's pinched. I'll put the fly or the hook in the vice. You want me to talk my way through this? or well, just get, get, just get yourself started and then I'll pick it up over here. Okay. I'll bounce back and forth. And okay. I'm just like going to... Start with a base wrap. So go ahead, dear. Say what you want to say. Oh, okay. Well, then I'm just starting with a thread base at the back of the hook on this particular fly. And actually what I'm doing is attaching the thread and building up um, a peg. And I want you to see how I kind of build it up. Now I'm going to go a little bit further down into the bend and come back. And that'll give me a tapered tag, if you will. And I'll get back here. And I'm just going to wrap forward and bring my UV into play here. Come on off of there. Um, the, the one thing that I have trouble with on this fly is remembering what order to go in. So I've got my uh, materials all laid out in order in these 
uh, hackle pliers that we use all the time, as you can see there. Yeah, that's a, the only thing about the fly that Gretchen's working is a, it's a real pain in the neck remembering which order the 10,000 materials go on the hook so that they'll all come out right. And this is just really a modified woolly worm, woolly bugger. So I'll start with the with the uh, copper wire. And I'm going to start with um, one single feather over at the materials area. I've got um, a shoulder from um, Cocktailion Hen, and I've got some soft tackle with Chickaboo. And today I'm just going to be doing a single feather out of the Cocktailion Hen. I'm going to stick that over to the the device. This is poly yarn is the thing I'm going to put on next. And I'm going to take my bodkin and uh, tease out all those knots. So I'll just cut a piece of doing that. What I'm doing here is just checking that I've got a the properly sized feather. I want a feather that has fibers on it about as long as the hook shake. And you can see how I'm checking that. I'll just set that down for a moment now and get started. What I do is I use the fuzz from the base of the feather. Well, I found it a heck of a lot easier if I work on fuzz from the last fly that I tied because trying <clears throat> to cut this stuff out of here the way I want it, uh, it's a lot easier to leave it there and use it as kind of a handle to wrap my hackle. So anyway, I'm always working on fuzz from the last fly on the current fly. And so you're always kind of about a half a fly behind, if that makes any sense. Now, you notice that I just cut a little bundle of that fuzz off, and this is going to be the tail. If I don't um, kind of get those knots out of there, this just doesn't look right because it's the, the back of the, the crayfish. So uh, it's worth spending the time. And I'm going to slip a little whip finish in right there. Put this off. Trim. Get some of this healthy hook that Dutch Bachman turned me on to. And I'll put just a tiny drop of that right there at the back. So I can slide my bead into place and it'll set up and be anchored into place. So what I'm using for the weight of this fly. And you can see this is going to be a a two bead fly, if you will. All right. And the body color, as you can see, is just, is just lime thread. I select the color based on where I'm going to be fishing the fly uh, and base that on the LaFontaine theory of attraction, and which is basically a summary of, from his book, Trout Flies. No. The Dry Fly New Angles, I think is the name of the book. And it's uh, on the theory of attraction and a long complicated chapter, if summarized in a sentence or two, is put a color in your fly that's predominant in the environment that you're fishing. So that's what I'm doing right now is uh, this is gonna be fished in central Idaho in the alpine forest type areas of central Idaho. So that will be, um, very green environment. So I make sure I have a little bit of green somewhere in the body of the fly. I'm having trouble getting my hackle tied on so it doesn't turn. Notice how I'm kind of just building it up as go. I go along there. Let me uh, pick up the one that I had in the vise so you can see. What you end up with is a bunch of staggered bits of that fuzz all along the hook shank. And it kind of ends up similar to a Matuka type except it's done by, by just putting in bundles of, of material. Next, I'm putting on um, marabou, and I'm going to cut out some of this, of the, the tip of the feather, because it will make it easier to divide later on when I'm dividing it. So I like it to be like, let's see, there we go. You can kind of see that. And the, the last bead, I want to have it setting right about there. And I want you to notice 
the feather, if wrapped and pushed back into the bullet head configuration that I have there and then glued in place, it'll lay flat along the hook. And I don't want that. So I use a bead right directly behind that hackle to flare the fibers open. And you'll see how that goes together here in just a little bit. But I need, need another bundle of fuzz. I don't know the actual name for it. I know the what the after shaft feather is, but I don't know what you call the fuzz. Jim Ferguson, you know what you call the fuzz? I guess you, I guess it's fuzz. Yeah, it's fuzz or the waist. <laughs> <laughs> fuzz or what? Waste. Waste. Oh yeah, well, it's not waste now. We it goes into the double E. All right, let's see. Now that's gonna need one more bundle. Just working my way forward. I'm going to make this about the shank length. Now, you notice that I crossed over that bead. I'm going to cross back over again just to do a good job of anchoring it, and then I'm going to tie that off. One of the things that uh, I like to do is switch thread colors up front. And I kind of try to match the feather. And, and I want to show you what happens if you don't do that. Here's one where I used the green all the way through. And not a problem, but I just thought the green kind of overpowered everything. Where this particular fly, I like I like the looks of it better. Whether it's um, whether the fish do or not, I don't know. I, I, both versions seem to fish really good last year. I'll have a better report after we get through this season, but I'm really excited about this flying. It's what? just a killer last last year. And Somebody started to say something? Yeah, me. Um, according to that sheet of paper you gave me about or feathers, they're called downy barbs. Okay, good. Downy barb they are. Thank you, Paul. Okay, I'm just adding Al the... Okay, somebody else is asking a question, yes? Yes, Al. Um, how many bundles of downy barbs, or what I call fluff, did you put between the first bead and the second bead? Um, that that varies depending on the length of the shank. I'm doing a 2X long <laughs> size 12 here. So it gets a, it's got four bundles, including the one that's the tail. Yeah, okay, can, thanks. And it, but that varies. Uh, as an example, here is let's see. Here's one that has like six, but it's oh, tied. Okay. A, you know, it's a, it's tied on a um, much larger hook, obviously, and it's a four x long hook instead of the two x long. Yeah. Okay. Got it. I'm tying the chamois on now. Oh yeah, you want to talk about that? <clears throat> and I'm going to, as you can see, I've been adding the materials starting um, with the uh, poly and then the chenille. So each one is back further. So I'm starting to shape a little. And you wanna be real careful with this so you don't make it too mm. steep. So, uh, <clears throat> and when you pull, when you put this chamois on, you need to pull it tight so that you're kind of, Thinning it a little bit as you put it on. You don't want to make it too thick. And it has a tendency to kind of roll on you. So be sure you're keeping it flat. Okay, I'm going to grab a hackle pliers and start wrapping my hackle. Stop right there. Now remember, I want to save this. What do they call that? Downy fire? Yeah, I'm going to save the fluff for the next fly anyway. <laughs> I can't remember what that was. Lou Duncan can attest. He gave me the greatest tip at the show in Albany on doing some stuff with, with feathers. We'll just leave it at that for now. I'm not going to go into the tip itself. But then he sent the reminder to me that I asked for. And uh, I had to have him explain the whole thing in, in writing because 
I, I can remember that there was a tip from Lou Duncan. I just couldn't remember what the darn thing was. So thank you, Lou, for taking the time to send that to me. Oh, not a problem, Al. I learned so much from you. It's nice to, you know, give back. I want you to notice that I'm just wrapping that hackle as if I had, well, it, it, right at this point, it's just a wet hackle. And I uh, tied it up, tied it off like I always do. And I'll do my jam head thread or the jam knot thread head. Okay, get the whip finish tool. <clears throat> now, one of the things that's kind of important with the head on this fly is before you glue it, it's a good idea to get the fiber straight. Because, uh, well, they kind of stick together and they're not always even around the hook. So I'm just going to take this brush and kind of brush everything back. What do you name this fly? This is a double E. And the story behind the fly is, um, well, again, great memory that I have. There was a couple of guys in Spokane, Washington, that I met back in the late 70s. I can't remember if it was Ed Wolf or Everett Carl. And anyway, they showed me a fly that this is based on. And, uh, and because it's one guy's name is Ed and the other one is Everett, and I don't know which one it came up with them, I just take the first initial from each of their names and I call it the double E. <laughs> anyway. Now, what I'm going to do, I want you to notice that first off, that I have that tackle pretty well placed uh, all the way around the hook. All right. So I'm going to take a drink straw, and I've just cut a small piece off, and then just slip it over the hook. What that does is just push everything back, but now I need to attach the thread. Now, this is important, the way we attach the thread. Let's see here. Well, I got a frayed thread. I don't want to, I don't want to do that. That'll break on me. All right. Now I think you can probably see what I'm doing there. Okay. Now I'm just gently going around the, the hackle placement, pull both directions, up and down. And bind some turns in place. Get rid of my hackle pliers, tie that off. And I will get my whip finish tool out. Hmm. And we'll just go ahead now and um, get ready to let's make sure that we have a good placement of that hackle all the way around. <clears throat> What's interesting is that that chamois, anybody that's washed a car with a chamois knows that that really soaks the water up fast. And once that son of a gun gets wet under the, the body material, it will uh, it will, will hold that water pretty well. What One of the things you don't want to do, it'll, first off, it'll sink your fly just like a rock. Not as good as 30 turns of lead, but it's if you're restricted on what you can use, then it will... It will do a good job for you. One of the things you don't want to do with that stuff, though, is you do not want to put one of the wet flies into your fly box because, well, I got a dead battery in my light, so let me get another light. Okay. Now let me uh, get a little bit more UV on there. Somebody's whispering. Well, I'm kind of in a, in a fix here. I must have left my light running this afternoon, and my battery's dead in both of my lights. So I'm going to take my microphone off. Gretchen's going to talk to you, and I'm going to go get another battery. Actually, I sabotaged you so I could talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm starting on my second one, so... Uh... Again, starting with the, the wire, the copper wire. 
think this is just such a simple fly. There's not too much to say. Everybody's tied a woolly worm, so, or woolly bugger, I guess. But it is a good fly. We fish sometimes not too far from the house down on the Snake River, and there's some really nice smallmouth bass. And uh, so we like to float from Swan Dam down to Immigrant Park. Is that what it is? And uh, it on the on the snake. And uh, float this fly along with us, and it just does a super job. Mm. Let's see. Mm. I think this is a little too short. I better cut another piece. We also have an articulating crayfish that we use too, but it's such a pain to fish or to tie. I prefer to do this and I think I do just as good with this. Hmm. Well, that kind of got all goobered up with running around to get batteries and everything. So <laughs> I'll do it. I promise folks, I can probably do a better job on the next one. So <clears throat> I'll uh, put another hook in there and I notice that I've got two beads on it. I probably ought to tell you about the beads. Or wait, Gretchen okay. and I got a heck of a deal buying some beads years ago. And at that time, we were offering beads in certain sizes and selling them through the website. And we were selling them wholesale to anyway, we were supplying beads, leave it at that. And um, we got one heck of a good deal on 10,000 medium sized beads, yeah. they were half of a millimeter too big. So they didn't fit with any of the product line that we've had. So I've been getting rid of them over the years. And out of that 10,000 that we had, that's what's left. And I would suspect in that box, I've got probably about 250, 300 in there. But anyway, that's what's left of that. So yeah. I'm, I've am i used those up for every doggone thing under the sun I can think of to, um, to, to get them used up, get them gone. Well... So that's why there are weights in the body right now. And they also add a little bit of accent like a, like a tinsel wood. Okay, putting the tag on. A little bit of accent. I don't know what you mean. A little bit of accent and what's accent? Weight, like a like tinsel in the in a rib does. A little bit of oh, it adds accent. Adds accent. Oh, I thought you said they have a little accent. I was gonna say, what's that on a I beach? could have said anything. You never can tell, dear. <laughs> I'll keep you. I'll keep you honest. So, Al, do you fish this as a nymph or as a wet fly? Yes. Both. <laughs> yes, I. I usually. I tell you, it it works so well for me. I I tried it in every configuration that I could think of, except as a dry fly, because obviously as a dry fly, it's not going to float very well. But here's the way I, I ended up fishing it, and it just seemed to work no matter what I did with it. And that was I'd, I'd high stick it up upstream, high stick it past me as the current would take it downstream, and then as it would start to drop down below me, I'd throw a couple of stack mins at it to get some more line out, and then let it swing across the current. Let it hang downstream from me for, oh, 10, 15 seconds, maybe. And then I'd pull out three more feet and let it just all of a sudden drop downstream. And if I hadn't hung, hung something by the time I let that fly drop downstream three feet, I, I very often had a fish right then if I didn't catch one in before it got to that point. So to answer your question, that's a tough one to answer. Okay. I, uh, well, I'm, I'm oftentimes searching for a good um, anchor fly at the at the very end of my uh, line, and have two wet flies above it, so that I have some, you know, something kind of anchoring it. And this looks like a good fly for that, with all that white that you have on it. Sure, sure. Well, I'm going to. Uh have to use off of the same feather that I'm going to be tying with because I somehow or another lost the one I had laying here to, you know, always working ahead of half of a fly. And anyway, I'll just go ahead and 
do a whip finish here so I can move the bead over that. And I will do just a tiny drop of the of the healthy hoof. Move the bead back around it. And then reattach my thread. I think you can see it just uh, my fiddling around here with this fly that that can be a pretty fast tie for you. And uh, if you don't have 10,000 beads like I did, here is some thinly cut chamois that could very well be worked into a body. I mean, this is just a general general design. You could make the body anything you wanted and, and add the wing, tail, whatever you want to call all this fuzzy stuff. Uh, Now, let's see here. I'll add this in. And uh, you're uh, picking out your, your, your yeah. marabou? No. Yeah. I'm going to move the other camera over here onto one of the double E's that I have in the in the pool. And then we'll cut to that after a bit. Yeah, this marabou had really, really, really long, skinny mm -hmm. tips. And so I very carefully pull off the tips uh, and try to make it look natural. But in this fly, it really doesn't matter if I were being judged by what I've just done. I probably wouldn't get a very good marks. but. <laughs> I like it better because it's supposed to look like something other than, than what it would. I mean, it, if you left it, it just wouldn't look right. So, and I could go through my box and see if I could find some better marabou, but this will work. I'm going to add just, uh, this will be my fourth bundle. It's a pretty small bundle of um wing tail fluff whatever you want to call it I, I call it wing material and it's kind of a home built matuka type wing i'm Home cutting this at an angle to try to help shape my body here so bevel that a little bit go ahead sorry dear no no you go right ahead cut that off and switch to another thread my gray thread to go with my gray feather. <clears throat> and now we'll just tie this feather in by the tip. Close wraps. I don't do pretty close wraps. I lose my, I have a chance of losing my feather down in between. So now I'm going to fold my hackle by just taking the edge of my scissors and folding it. Whoops, that didn't work out worth a darn. Hold on. <laughs> uh oh. I forgot my chamois. That will uh, kind of mess up the weighting of the fly. <laughs> It's laying right there in front of me. Well, yeah, you can, you can probably kind of sneak it in there, can't you? Oh, yeah. Gretchen, does that fly have eyes? You know, I well, sometimes I do put eyes on it, but I didn't this time for some reason. I don't know why. I've got good good point. I've got some great... Um, where are they? Oh, over here. I've got some great, really weird looking eyes from um, bead chain. I got some colored bead chain here. I used to have a whole bunch of it, but this is what, I, oops. This is what I've got now. 
<laughs> you, know, you can hold it up the other way, Gretchen, and let me do the wide shot for you. You can hold up the, that bag towards that camera right over there. Yeah, there you go. So uh, I've got some that are already cut apart, but I rather than dig around, wait, here we go. <clears throat> I do have some that are cut. Let's see what these look like. Anyway, while she's looking for that, I just wanted you to notice that I used the edge of my scissors to fold the hackle along both the top and bottom of the stem, I'm getting ready to wrap it. Okay, I found some really cool ones that are left over. So we'll just go ahead and uh, let's see, I want to put those back. Do I want to put those back here? Where yep. do I want them? Or here? <laughs> Usually they're in the back <clears throat> next to the pinchers. But... Yeah, let's see how I'm going to do you that. To do it, you'll have to do it in the next one, Grinch. Oh, Oh, it's a challenge. Oh, you'll figure something out. Yeah. Let's see if I can do this. This is the challenge. I'm glad you mentioned that because look at that. Oh, 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 yes. Did you make it? Yeah. I should I should know. I, I shouldn't even ask. <laughs> well, when I tied a bunch of them uh, from the recipe when you did this earlier, I put the beads on the bottom. And I ended up because because you know I and I sent you a question. Did you put those on the bottom or the top? Because they looked like they were on the bottom, but all I ended up doing was cutting down the the gape of the hook. Then, ah, uh, yeah, yeah. But if you if you put them on top, you can tie the fly upside down so that you actually have a hook point up through the water column, and and that's that's yeah. something else that we that we do. One of the things that I've never tried though, is doing that <laughs> with chamois for the weight, because it, I don't know, I don't know which one is gonna counteract the other until we've done a test on it. Okay, now let's get my chamois out here and add it. Now I'm gonna add on my- Why I kind of had quit putting eyes on this and I'm not sure why. Okay, and now I'm going to. Uh, I think I'm gonna pull my scissors out. Take a loop around very gently. Now I'm going to pull down and up at the same time, down and up. That way, the thread torque is going in both directions, and it doesn't misalign my hackle. Okay, I like the head on that one better. If I don't mess up the UV this time, and I should have a good battery. This time, I think what I did is I was tied the fly that I showed you that was in the vise as a is the roadmap fly. I did that this afternoon, and I think I walked off and left the the light shining, which uh, that doesn't do you any good. Doesn't keep the batteries. Gretchen, this is Kathy yeah. Hamilton. I was yeah, wondering Kathy. how wide this high, how wide a strip did you cut of that chamois? Kind of between a fourth and a. Uh, eighth of a inch. So I want it less than a fourth. But an eighth was is just a little small. I might try to go an eighth if I were tying smaller ones. But, you know, my, this is not a huge crayfish. The ones on the Payette River here are just about that size. Uh, so I think that's a... a a size four is pretty good, and yeah, and we like them a little bit smaller on the the lower Madison. If you uh, go out uh, straight west of Bozeman from Four Corners, um, when you hit the Madison River, there that's the low, known as the lower Madison for at least for the people that live in the Bozeman area. Um, a, a size four or six. Crayfish is just about the perfect. Oh, and the brown trout. Oh, the brown trout just go. Oh, it's so much fun. Oh, crayfish. Oh, it's just amazing. There's a bunch of weed beds there late in the year when the browns are, are moving back in. And uh, you kind of, I like to toss it up on the weed bed and then pull it 
down, let it drop down, and there's usually a a brown trout hiding under that weed bed, and they just come up and nail it. It's a lot of fun. No, I've I've got one that turned out a little bit better when I didn't have to go looking for batteries. And that's uh, as you can see that the one that's in the vice there is a it's a two bead ready to go. Now let's take a look for a moment at a larger version swimming in the five mile bar pool. And there it is swimming away. And now that particular one is larger and it's tied out of a soft tackle with chickaboo. And I think that that is a size, um, it's eight, I believe, eight, three X long or four X long. But anyway, you can see there that's, um, and, and by the way, it's got three beads in its body. That one gets down into the water column really fast. Anyway, uh, I apologize for all the repetitiveness with this type of a presentation, but well. That fly had a lot of action in the water, though. Uh, it just got a ton of action in the water. But, you know, uh, what the one that Barry uh, did last night, the um, my, it escaped, it escaped me, but anyway, it's uh, the the nymph, the polyrosporo nymph, the casual dress, I think it's called. Yeah, and the way he tied it is it's got swimming motion in the water, like you just flat wouldn't believe. And in fact, my favorite nymph of all time is a modification of the of the polyrosporo. A casual dress and i call mine the muddler nymph and you can figure out what i've changed on it i did a little bit <laughs> different with the body and i got i didn't use ostrich i used a, a dubbed muddler head but and that's my my number one nymph in my box is the is the muddler nymph it has been for well since i stumbled onto the idea of it uh Back when I lived in Sandpoint, in the in the mostly through the eighties. So and what do you now, what do you consider your fly to be? Is it a leech? What what would you call it? The way it swam in the pond, in your little uh, water chamber there, it looked uh, looked kind of leechy. What 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 do you think the fish think it is? I think they just take it as something that's moving. And, and honestly, Chuck, I have no idea. All I know is that it's just one hell of a killer. <laughs> it's uh, Now, it could be also the thing, and, we, and I've talked about this a bunch of times, and I use the illustration of uh, when Crystal Flash first came on the market back in the at the end of the 80s and in the early 90s. I'll tell you what, when we when it first came out, if you had a couple of strands of Crystal Flash, in your fly, um, you were fishing and your catch rate was substantially more than it was with just a plane. You picked the fly. Let's just say woolly bugger for argument's sake. And um, anyway, uh, eventually they got, they got used to that crystal flash and it wasn't any better than ones without crystal flash. I'm not so sure that this isn't something with action that is just slightly different than what they've seen before. And, and and I know that's not a very good answer, but it's about the best one I can come up with. Can you see those eyes? Yes. Yeah, I can good. really, really see them good in it. Yeah, they're good looking eyes. Yeah. Yeah, this, um, box of bead chain eyes has some really these are some of the original ones i had i don't know if you can see yeah, what was that one white we eye and those. one black eye yeah it's black it, and white i'll be darned uh, they were that was another one of the deals gretchen ran across this deal and well she bought a bunch of them and uh we we sold those too we called them what razzle eyes or something like yeah, that yeah we did razzle eyes yeah yeah, there's, and I got pink. I've got green. These are really nice ones for damselflies. Let's see if I can show this. <clears throat> oh boy, that's not going to work. 
Darn. This white, I'll just use the tweezers. I'm going to put another tuft of this uh, fuzz in there. There we go. Those are green, I don't know if you can tell. Yeah, they're you can around. see the green, yeah. If they're, they're splotchy, uh, splatter paint kind of on them, which makes them look pretty realistic. And then these are some bigger green ones. And then these, I think, just look weird. <laughs> like on a shrimp. And you notice that I just flipped the thread right over the top of that bead and <clears throat> not worried about it. It gets pretty well hidden up in the body. And all it's doing is, like I said, adding a bit of flash. And uh, <clears throat> it's um, uh, putting weight in there. And as you can see, with 10,000 of them that I had, to, I've done a pretty good job of getting pretty good job of getting rid of them or using them. Well, here's an I have a whole nother box here. These are, oh no, of those? Oh yeah. Oh, you mean the razzle eyes? Yeah. Oh, okay, good. I thought you you were gonna say we had more of these off-sized ones. And I said, oh Jesus. We might. I've been working for years to get rid of them or use them. Yeah. I bought some craft eyes from the local Chinese junk shop. And uh, I use those for eyes using, I use that easy clay um, pattern that uses it and added the Chinese eyes on it. And it turned into a, 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 a shrimp pattern. Ah, really? I well, I got to tell this is the first time I've used this particular tool, and this is from uh, Jan Aben in the Netherlands. And anyway, uh, it's one of those sharing kind of things that we'll be talking about again later this evening after after we uh, get through here, Ty, and, and things just show up in the mail from people, and we <laughs> sure we sure appreciate the the fun we have. But anyway, this is a this is a hackle folder, and I keep forgetting that I got the darn thing, and I go back to using my my scissors. But you can see that little little notch there is for folding the hackle, and it does a pretty darn good job. I'm I'm pleased. I'm pleased. I suppose I should get back to tying. Hey Al. Yeah. Uh, this is Rick. Uh, <clears throat> in in your materials list, you didn't list the chartreuse thread. Just FYI for you, but, but oh, okay. Also, but also for me, what uh, what weight of thread is that? Is that six odd or three odd? <clears throat> yeah, you can just about be guaranteed that it's one of the two, and and it's all we all we tie with is uh, three sizes of Danville, <clears throat> and this happens to be six o, okay. or or seventy denier. The gray, you mean? The gray is 70, and and yeah. the the other one is uh let's see, that's that's um uh, that's 140, so that's 30. Okay, thank you. Al, this is this is David. A question yeah. outside of tailing material, how much over time have y'all used like this CDL um hen? Because the speckling is amazing on that stuff. And it just seems like I haven't seen a lot of it until lately. Um, I use it a lot. <clears throat> One of the things of, about the seat, any hen feather, when you get it, get into a chunk of hen, there's a whole lot of feathers that are about the same size as far as length of fiber. Right. And it's one of the things that's awfully nice as compared to partridge. There's some a really good range of feather sizes in a partridge. But I don't know about you guys, but it seems to me about all I can get of any one particular size is a couple of three dozen. And then I'm out of that particular size and I have to be doing something else to to get a to get the size of feather that I want. If I sit down with a 
a partridge pelt and I have 15 dozen soft tackles to do of a certain size, it's going to take several skins to get the, the feathers that I need. Or I'm going to do one of the things that I've shown you all how to do of uh, taking big feathers and using them on small flies. There, that's a, but I really love the way that, doesn't that, that cocktail you own hand just, I don't know, I just like it. Mm. It's good looking stuff. <clears throat> and I'm using some of the bigger feathers out of this shoulder, you know, clear up here right next to the wing area mm. is where, where I'm using them. And I still got some really nice, a lot smaller feathers down here that will be doing good 16s and 14s of this particular, uh, the double E fly. As a side light, those cocktail birds are cranky mean things. Oh boy, they are. Oh, Jesus. We <laughs> now, Tom first got them when I was working for him <clears throat> uh, back in, well, it would have been about 2001 or two, something like that. And anyway, Every now and then a rooster would get out of the would get out of its cage. And if you weren't watching what was going on, those darn things would start hunting you. <laughs> they would sneak up behind you and then fly up in the air and go to squawking and come at you with their claws sticking out in front of them as they flew at you. And uh, they were nasty, just plain nasty. Al, what's the reason for the large bulbous head on the, on, on your uh, on your fly? <laughs> It was either Ed or Everett that came up with that in another configuration on a nymph. And that's how I, I that's I used it as the uh, inspiration for this particular pattern. And uh that's what it that's what the 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 original inspiration had. Okay. Do you know what the purpose of it was? I have no idea. But you just leave I it mean, there. All I can tell you is Ed or Everett or whomever was probably having a beer one night and came up with this idea. I I don't know. It's just <clears throat> <laughs> but it's no different than a bullet head on a hopper pattern or something like that. You know, it's a there's some theory that a large head sometimes causes a vibration, a water vibration that the fish can pick up. And I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, they say on a lot of the steelhead flies that we we try to get a small head, but sometimes the larger heads are, are there on the original patterns and they seem to uh, work okay. Well, the larger head would cause uh, flow separation around the fly at certain water velocities, but I don't know if that's... Make it wiggle more, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I, interesting, though. So, Al, I'm sorry I may have missed your opening. I was a little late getting on, but I thought you guys were going to a show in Idaho. Did that get canceled, or what happened? No, no, the show, the show is still going on. We just elected to not go. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, our, our trip home from... From uh, <laughs> Albany, uh, Albany was um, was an adventure, and <laughs> we and in the process of getting home, we decided that maybe we've had all the adventures that we need after forty years of doing these. I swear to God that three quarters <laughs> of the shows that you go to, well, it's a it's some type of a white knuckle deal to get there and to get home, and yep. we decided that there were going to be no more white knuckles for us. Very good. And uh, as a side, if you pull up Idaho Falls on your road condition, you'll see it might have been a pretty good decision not to go. <laughs> it's, Probably. it's snowing on and off. So and... We, but we've, we've got some shows coming up that are, okay, as an example, the, the Branson show in, in September. Well, that, that shouldn't be, I, we shouldn't have too much snow conditions to deal with on that one. <laughs> so there, there's other shows that we can go to, but... I can tell you, after 40 years of traveling to show some of them back to back, some of them flying from one end of the country to the other. Oh, gosh. It's all I can tell you is we could go on for hours with with all the, the, the things one that, that I remember the most. In our wisdom, we decided to do um, the New Jersey show back to back with San Mateo. Yeah, two sides so, of the country. So we drove our, our uh, motor home 
to San Jose and left it at Barbara's house along with the dog. <laughs> and we flew to New Jersey, got there just fine, had a wonderful show. And the next day when we tried to get home, I don't know if it was fog or I don't know. Bad, bad snowstorm. Bad, anyway, we ended up taking, well, we landed at about five different towns, airports in order to get home. And of course, we just barely made it to the show. Yeah, we got to the show at about 930 in the morning after being up all night, tra traveling all over the United States. And um, that was a that was a tough show. That was that was one of the tougher <laughs> ones. This, all, but the, the, this traveling to shows uh, is a lot different for the exhibitors and the people that are that are doing it in the in the business end of the deal than the people that are waiting outside to pay their ticket and come in and have a good time. <laughs> There's a difference, and I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Anyway, and I kind of miss it. I, in in some ways, I, it we really enjoyed it. It's one of the things that uh, we usually did the video theater and all those places, and that had its challenges as well. But anyway, that's probably the last one that I'm going to tie it at, at like this. Um, it said we'll watch for a minute while one swims, and Gretchen can work on on the one she's working on, and then we'll get ready to. To have a chat for a while this evening. <clears throat> Different sizes of of uh, feathers on this earth. Of anyway, I'm having to pull some off because they're different sizes. That's just weird. And I'm just going to do the whole thing. In fact, I'm going to do. Here's. I'll what tell I'm you the do. story about the fly that Gretchen's tying it. One day I was headed to the Madison River with clients. Uh, and, we, and we've been doing really well with big brown woolly buggers to, um, on, on the brown trout. And so I was taking the clients up there and she told me that there was a surprise in my lunch. And she had tied some of these up. And I forgot to look at my lunch until after lunch. Of course, I found them in my lunch when, I, when we stopped to eat. And then we had kind of a quiet morning, a few fish, but nothing nothing very spectacular. And so we put this easy crayfish fly on and the guy in the front of the boat, a young fellow with his dad in the back of the boat, hooked into this just huge brown. And he was hooping and hollering and just having a wonderful time. And we were drifting right by this one really tall bank right below the bridge there on the lower Madison. And this absolutely gorgeous redhead stood up. She didn't have a stitch of clothes on. She'd been out sunbathing, wanted to see what was going on. And the kid damn near fell out of the boat. I had to reach up and grab his belt to keep him from falling out of the boat. And well, anyway, it was a memorable trip with a memorable sighting, shall we say. And uh, I'll never forget it because every time I see this darn fly, I don't think about the brown trout. I hate to tell you this, but I don't think about the brown trout. But anyhow. How are you doing over there, dear? Well, I'm struggling a little bit getting okay. this, the last, um, so what well, you, you want to do, this is, I'm, something new. I'm pulling the fibers off of the stem. And building the claw, and, kind of like. Building the claw. I and I, stuck and some stuff. That's and I think I'm liking it. Look at this. You know, I was thinking about uh, that this morning when, well, when I was having my coffee, and I was wondering about braiding a little bit of that. Braiding it? Yeah, braiding some of it there so we'd what? end up with a braided uh, claw. How would you braid it? Oh, I'd, like we did in the book. Just taken in. Like we did in what book? The, the weaving book. Oh. We just, only I would braid the marabou rather than some other stuff. We did, as I recall, we in that in that book we did a braided body uh, damselfly. Oh, okay, nymph, okay, okay. And uh, just by braiding it together. And we'll I another, think I'm gonna like that. I'm gonna turn this. See, I, you see what I'm doing? I, yeah. Let me let me get a bigger shot, closer shot for everybody there. Okay. There you go. <clears throat> I just tore the fibers off of the stem and just put them on either side. And uh, I was having trouble with my, my marabou. And I think that was kind of a, a 
workable solution. So we'll see how it turns out. Well, that last group of polyfibers you pull up between them will, will for the shell back will work pretty good. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I, we at one time we tried making the shell back out of um, chamois. Looked good. Gets into the water, and of course, the shell back is a lot heavier than the rest of it. And no matter what, your fly is upside down. <laughs> So a great idea that that the uh, chamois ended up inside the body where it could sink the fly in the proper in the proper orientation. Gretchen, I apologize if I miss it, but what color is that uh, marabou? It's orange. I dyed it. Yeah, it's okay. kind of an orangey, orangey brown color. Isn't yeah. that the one you dyed for Lafontaine? Yeah, this this yeah. As a matter of fact, we were doing. I don't remember which. La Fontaine video it was, but we needed orange marabou. And uh, we were in Missoula and they didn't have any of the shop there. So I dyed it. Um, this is some dye. I don't know. What's, I can't remember the name of the company, but it's really good as a dye. Do you uh, start with white marabou and dye it? And that, that's what you yes. do? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if there, you is that look at my dye by any chance, pardon, Rit dye. No, R I T. This is a this is a commercial, commercial dye. The same dye. stuff we got at Whiting Farms. I can't remember the. I I can run up and look at one of the cans. Can we... yeah, I can't remember the name of it, but they have really good dye. Yeah, it's a it's on par. It's on par with Vineyard's dye. Okay. Jacquard. Vineyard in the UK, V E N I A R D. I, I, would, if, I was wondering if the dye that Gretchen used was jacquard. No, I don't think so. Okay. Um, they make silk dyes. Yeah, I don't think because I they've got the, that's in that one catalog I get in I, that this was. Go look and see what it is. What's that? Find out what this die is. Oh, I'll be I'll be back. I'll yeah, run to go upstairs real quick. Because we've got that big can that we've got the bird seed in. Yeah. That's that die. I used it. We had some uh velour too, and I, I dyed a lot of velour with it. And uh it, it is an acid, you have to put acid with it, of course. So I use a lot of vinegar. I really like the black. It has a good solid black. And you can order retail, I think, from them. But at the time we were ordering wholesale because we were reselling it. Uh, Gretchen, when, you, when you're when you doing your dyeing, what, what size bath are you usually using? And then it's really, I'm back, in, I'm back backing into uh, the question of about how much vinegar you use per quart or whatever. Oh gosh, you know, I I usually dye um, in a uh, soup pot, a big soup pot, you know what I mean? Yes. And um, There's probably three or four quarts. Yeah, and I, I'm trying to think how much vinegar I use. Seems to be used about a half a cup anyway. Yeah, I, well, a half to a quarter, depending on how big the batch was. I've got it all written down. Okay, that's right. I, yeah. Anyway, okay, that not, diet not, was the diet. Measuring it, I'm sorry. No, no, go right ahead. You're not measuring it in drops. You're measuring it in half cupfuls, it sounds like. Yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, that dye that, uh, that we're using, we've got several commercial dyes, but this is one that Whiting Farms gets for... For their particular, anyway, it's one of the ones they get, and it's Lowenstein and Sons, and it's out of the Bay Area. It's not probably not one that you. No, it's, it's, it's a commercial dye. It's you're not going to find it in any store. It's uh, only available to industry. <clears throat> I do use Rit dye though. Um, I've used a lot of the Rit um, neons and. Um, 
No, it seems to me the olive writ is about as good as anything you yeah, can get. Yeah, I've used that. I got those eyes a little far back. Eh. Oh, well. This one's going to be a little different looking. It's going to have a short, stubby body because I got the eyes too far back. Yeah, that lower Madison River where the, where this fly was, where Gretchen originally tied this fly for, is a almost like a spring creek. It's a you can wade a good portion of it, and it's nothing but sandy bottom, almost no rocks, sandy bottom, and weed beds. And you just got you can you'd be standing up in the boat going along, and you'd see the dark stripes, and that's the uh, weed beds, and then you'd see the tan stripes between the dark stripes. And that was the where you'd cast, and that is a um, sandy area in between the weed beds. Of course, the trout would lay up in those weed beds, and if you could get a fly drifting down through the one of those sandy areas, well, when you got a good drift through there, you were in you were in the money. It's a really good spot to take somebody who is learning how to row. Yeah, because the water. I mean, you can you can get into trouble, but it's pretty forgiving. There's not it's any. It's pretty bad forgiving. There. Yeah, there's a few big rocks. That river oh, sounds like some distractions. Um, I'm the sorry. River, somebody asked. I, I the river sounds like the Menominee when we go smallmouth fishing, where it's a ah. sandy bottom and it's got the weed beds, and you try and go in between. It's a challenge, yeah. but it is fun. <laughs> Well, you know, the Owyhee River in Oregon here, not too far from us, is the same way, too. There's some, one day I spent how long? Two, oh. and, a, two and a half hours yeah, like casting that. to a single fish <laughs> that was coming up in a weed, but a weed bed and taking a fly and then coming back down. It was so much fun. Uh, just ch kept changing the fly because he kept refusing. And that's that's the kind of fishing I really like to do. And finally did get him to take a size 18 <clears throat> mahogany yeah. nymph. Yep. I still remember. That's crazy, huh? It's funny. Some fish, you can catch tons of fish and never remember them. And then you'll have some that you'll remember forever. It's, <laughs> it's just, well, you know how it is. You all have been there. I really like these. I think this turned out better. I like that. Look me, at that. Let me put that over here in front of. Yeah. So I'm going to change my directions for that fly and have you take, rip the fibers off of the stem. I've been tying that fly for how many years? <laughs> I just figured Let's, out. Um, that makes a good looking woolly booger crayfish. Or easy crayfish. I put gold ice on that one. And of course, my recommendation is the the chamois is a great thing for waiting when you are in a situation where you're not allowed to have lead or non-lead or whatever weight in the in the body. And um, in some places you're not allowed to have any kind of extra weight. Well, chamois is an extra weight, it's fly tying materials. In fact, you can dye that chamois different colors and make it the body color. Hey, folks, that's it for tonight. That's a wrap. All we did is tie a few flies, but we hope you enjoyed what we had to offer. Until next time, good tying. <laughs>